ARFID, according to the American Psychiatric Association, is a disturbance in eating where the individual does not meet nutritional needs and has extreme picky eating. But how do we how do we measure extreme picky eating? That's kind of nonspecific there. It can be due to individual an individual having a low appetite or lack of interest in eating. It can be an avoidance of food based on the food's sensory characteristics. And it and or it could be negative concerns about eating, such as a fear of choking or vomiting. The most important part in this statement is the and or. An individual does not need to have all three of these descriptions going on in order to have a diagnosis of ARFID. So when we look at these three areas, we can actually relate these as being the three different subtypes of ARFID of what's going on with the eating difficulties. Additional requirements for a diagnosis of ARFID could include significant weight loss, loss, nutritional deficits, reliance on a feeding tube or supplemental nutrition, and or, again, we have that and or interference with social or psychosocial functioning. So when I went over this definition, I thought, does this really describe a lot of the patients that we've seen in the past? And maybe these are the individuals that we've diagnosed with a sensory-based feeding disorder. Kind of fits all of that thinking that's going on. The difference between ARFID and anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa is that there is no concern about weight loss or body image. However, we will see how similar ARFID actually is to anorexia nervosa, especially when we look at all of the research coming up. Let's go over some case examples that may or may not be indicative of ARFID. So here we get to apply some of the knowledge that we went over. Um, and again, we can't fully diagnose these individuals, but at least we should have the knowledge base to say, gosh, there's more going on here than just a typical feeding therapy or, um, yeah, a feeding therapy referral that we may need help in extra areas. So here we go. Okay, so our first patient is um, one who had two stints of therapy, first being referred at one year of age, and then the second referral for, th for therapy was right before he turned two. His first referral was due to a report of choking on purees and solids. During examination, oral tightness and reduced range of motion were noted, and he had a pretty strong gag reflex. His eating skills were inconsistent day by day. Uh, a referral to ENT was made uh, to evaluate for a possible tongue tie. The patient ended up having an upper lip phrenectomy and tongue tie clipping. He and his family completed five months of therapy to improve oral motor movements for feeding. The patient progressed to being e able to eat many different textures of food without gagging or choking and was subsequently discharged from therapy. So up to this point, maybe some of us in the pediatric world would describe this as kind of a typical referral that we might see. Okay, now let's talk about that second referral back, which occurred approximately four months after he was discharged the first time. His family was again reporting gagging and choking on foods, but this was following a episode of him having strep throat. At this point, he had lost many foods that were in his diet. The patient again appeared to have significant oral tightness, with the majority of it being in his tongue. He appeared to have some oral and possible pharyngeal coordination, was, which was not noted upon at the initial referral for therapy with his swallowing. And so I, we question at this point, did the tightness that was there before now got worse because of this choking incident, um, gagging and choking incidents that were happening again following strep throat? So video fluoroscopy was recommended to assess his swallowing. Instances of penetration were noted, but residue was cleared with subsequent swallows. 
The patient's mother suspected some possible gastrointestinal issues at this time as well, or food allergies, she was thinking, because he was reporting pain after eating. So I question if this might be like a comorbidity going on. All right, then shortly after his swallow study, the patient was seen in the emergency department uh, due to significant consequences. Uh, constipation. So I wonder if this is another negative consequence going on here. He was formally referred to gastroenterology. While we were doing therapy, oral skills did improve and um, we had implemented oral motor exercises again and it got to the point where he was not choking on foods any longer. However, his diet was still extremely limited, um, which may be that sensory component that we've talked about. When he went in to see uh, gastroenterology, there was a concern about his overall growth. The child had celiac testing that was done, but that was negative. He had an upper GI where laryngeal penetration was noted, and it also revealed some mild gastroesophageal reflux symptoms. He was prescribed medication for the constipation. Um, and um, another swallow study was recommended. So we had a little bit of a brief hiatus from therapy in there, but upon return to therapy, oral tightness was again noted. We did therapy again um, to improve that overall movement. Over some time, there were also continued weight gain concerns, and the patient ultimately had a G-tube placed following some trials of NG feeds. He actually had a lot of vomiting and even more constipation issues that stemmed after the tube feeding started. The repeat BSS revealed laryngeal penetration and aerophasia. Uh, GI care was then transferred to a different facility. Cystic fibrosis testing was negative. And uh, the patient was actually slated to have some gastro gastric motility studies completed out of state. However, with the COVID-19 pandemic, those were not completed. Um, he was eventually referred back to ENT and lingual phrenectomy was completed a second time. There were was an increase in oral tightness again as the patient he continued to have more vomiting with his tube feedings. After approximately of six months of all of this going on, the, act- the patient was actually starting to demonstrate some weight gain, so his G-tube was removed. He continued to drink a nutritional supplement, which we know this is part of that ARFA diagnosis. Um, after his G-tube was removed, he did stop vomiting, but he still had issues with stooling. It actually was ranging between diarrhea and constipation at this point. There was um, some discussion made with his gastroenterologist about the weight gain issues and tube feedings and and everything and how that related to a possible ARFA diagnosis, but it never was officially made. So at the end of his second stint of therapy, the patient was back eating a relatively wide variety of foods. He was chewing and managing food well. He wasn't coughing or choking with swallowing, and he was actually continuing to try new foods. Uh, like vegetables. That was one area that his mom was concerned about that he wasn't eating any of. And the therapy technique that worked for him was presenting new foods with preferred foods on the plate and then just modeling eating for him without making comments about what he was eating, the new food being there, and he just started to join in. And this was a way that he was starting to taste some new foods and then adding those foods into his diet. So could this case be indicative of ARFID? I think we need to, some questions that we would ask is figure out which came first, the ARFID or GI, um, or were the GI symptoms separate from that diagnosis? We would then think it's a comorbidity. We have some reports of sensory. We have some reports of an aversive situation. We had a lack of intake. Um, he needed supplementation. There was a lot going on there that kind of fit the bill for a diagnosis of ARFID. Um, so there's, we might, even though we can't diagnose this, we might think that we would need to refer to have this diagnosis either confirmed or ruled out, I think for sure.